band who puts their money where their mouths are. He says they're a band who takes arms against a sea of troubles, and they've campaigned for things like nuclear disarmament, environmental issues, and less military spending. Garrett is a lawyer surfer who actually ran for office in Australia in 1984. And it's weird because Midnight Oil is a very different commodity in a rock and roll arena filled with preening power trippers. They're a democratic collective, and they have a message that needs to be heard by the world. If you're really looking for voices that are calling out about what's happening to Earth and uh, who are guarding it and guarding the special places, that's what poets and musicians can do, and I think that's what they are doing. Mm. You know, they're screaming out. It's a primal scream. They're expressing it in their art. They're not always screaming out in the right directions, though. No. And the states we have, you know, there's bands that are racist and homophobic sure. and getting headlines just like everybody else. Yeah, well, that's that's a, it's a corrupted culture that's that a, they come from, and they, that's, they, a, they're that's an abuse of your position. Mm. But you're wrapped up in that same boat by sure. virtue of being musicians. Sure. Yeah. No, yeah, no. Well, that's why we try to take some time and well, a lot of time, actually, being responsible about what we're saying, you know, sort of research it a bit and yeah. not just sort of make some I don't think, outrageous yeah. generalisation. Well, I don't think, think, think that racist or homophobic or misogynist... Uh, Misanthropic. <laughs> Misanthropic. Misanthropic. No, no, misogynist lyrics mm. or attitudes are defensible mm. in 1990. I mean, you know, there might be a lot of bluster that comes from ignorant people who uh, have made their music and they're living from it and they might defend it under various titles, but I just don't think it's defensible, whereas I think that what Midnight Oil is on about is ultimately defensible. Some of those bands that promote those sorts of views are the ones which, to us, seem like one giant parading anachronism in the 90s, you know, sort of like the, the, waste, the, the waste yourself 60s mm. the sort second, of mentality brought into the wrong decade. It's like, yeah. go away, you know. It's we the, we grew up with that. That's all. That's, that's gone. That's sort of like cool. You know, well, let people, me say this. Remember when people were cool? <laughs> it's the sick end of the 80s. I'm sure of that. Yeah. Well, it's not even cool, though, is it? It's just, I know. I'm saying there was, yeah. there was sort of ge generations of cool and psychedelia and, and that's all been swept under the carpet, you know. But you're right. I mean, there's no doubt that the business is perverted. I mean, it always has been. It probably always will be. When you look at the oils uh, musically, I mean, from the first record to this latest one, there, there's some massive changes that have gone on there. Evolution. It's just yeah. happened. I think it's honestly just happened. It's not as though the band ever has sort of consciously gone out to sort of take a market or make a record to get to a point. I mean, it's the songs of the time that, that the boys have got and what happens in that room, and that's the record that you end up with at the end of the day. And I actually think that the oil stuff will sound reasonably consistent, you know, when you, when you listen back to it. There are production values are better now, mm. and there's good music on this record, but we've never been the kind of band that's chosen paths. It's just always been what's come out at that point in time. Yeah, I think we're glad that we made a record the first one back in 78, which we did in five or six days, you know, with this lousy budget and with an engineer who didn't know what he was doing. I mean, you could, every band should have a record like that. Yeah. It gives you a perspective of where you came from. somewhere to go to. That's right, so you can say the beginning of the band, you know, sort of in, and there was all this music in between, and, you know, they... They did a lot of touring, did a bit of growing up, maybe, you know? You know, I mean, the, the interesting thing about it for me is that when I first walked into the, to the garage, you know, and heard uh, them playing, mm. it's pretty much the same as, as what's happening here when we stand here today. And I think that that's, if you like, sort of an unalterable character. I mean, it hasn't been static. It, we haven't got stuck in a groove. I think that uh, the band has always wanted to express itself musically. People haven't been content just to s sit with a formula. <laughs> We've always been interested in trying different things. The musicians have always been pushing, which is why the records have gone on. Yeah. But there's been an element in it, which is just said, this is what we're doing at the time, let's do it. You, know? you guys have always operated it, or tried to operate it as, as a collective. And you tried. may be, it, well, you may be the only living a example of it working. A democratic socialist collective. I yeah. can't think of another band that, that it works, when they, especially when they start, you know, becoming quite successful. It just breaks down for some yeah. reason. Well, yeah, I think that's, that's what we were saying in the car. I think it does. I mean, we're very different sorts of there people. There must be other bands, though, that... Not many. Don't you two operate as a democratic social collective? Provided you do what Bono wants. <laughs> Could you get that on film? <laughs> <laughs> that's not true. And the Edge. <laughs> and Larry. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and they thought you were their friend. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in trouble again. Uh, no. I, I, we, there probably are some others. I mean, we, we've, been, we've been talking a little bit about this today. <coughs> you know, everybody in the band sort of has their roles and plays their roles, and p some people have got strengths in some areas and some in other areas. But most, well, yeah, most people in bands know that there's a lot happens behind the scenes. You know, there's a lot of people that are in the public eye, but if you talk to people in bands, they realise that there's a whole lot of, you know, musical things happening here, and there's a whole lot of, dare I say, 
business decisions that even Bears have got to make? Not that you sort of come in in the morning with a briefcase, but let's face it, we're in the 90s now. It's the corporate rock world. You know, if you've got to find your way through it, it's a bit easier if you've had a, you know, degree in advanced quantum mechanics. Mm. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> it is easy. <laughs> yeah, that's where we went wrong. We haven't got anyone. <laughs> My feeling has always been if I can say what I want to say or if it's, an, if it's presented to me in a way which I would feel really comfortable with and adds up to what Midnight Oil is, then I'm really happy to sing it. If it doesn't, then you know, I'll probably put the red pen through it and, and, and have a go at it myself. Mm. And I've done it sufficient in the past to satisfy myself and I, if I get a chance and some time I'll try and have a go in the future. But I'm not as, I'm not as talented as what these other fellas are. They're real good at it, you know, and mm. I, I'm, I'm a real sort of grind on that stone. No, I'm sorry, that's no good. Mm. Um, the other thing is that it's important for me, particularly being uh, the singer and the person that everybody sees in the press and, and who sort of tends to dominate the image a lot, to be able to say that Midnight Oil is a real band and that it's, I'm not insisting that I have my finger stamped on everything and I would never do that, particularly if it wasn't any good. I think that... And we wouldn't let you. And you wouldn't let me. They wouldn't let me, you know, they'd be strict with me. Uh, we, we are unified in that sense and, and you leave your ego at the front door here, you know, you, you do something for the whole. And uh, I personally think that even though we struggle with that sometimes, it's one of the things that's kept us strong and, and, and productive and creative for a reasonable period of time. And I think it's one of the things that gives communities the potential to be creative and productive as well, because we are really different people, mm. but we share some, some strong ideas and we share a love of making music together. You know, and so long as we've got that, then we're doing something which is okay. So. Mm. Are you as clear now about, about what your intent, what your goals are as when you started, do you think? We operate still as the band, as the five members plus Gary, the six member telephone facilitator management type golfing person. It's quite insulated in, in a sense that, that, that in terms of contemporary fashion, I mean, I just wouldn't, you, you could ask me who's number one in the dance clubs and I, I wouldn't be able to give you an answer, you know. Sort of. Midnight All was two years ago. Beds are burning. Hit the, the, hit, well, that hit the, an, that hit the North American dance show. That was an astonishing quirk of fate that can <laughs> only happen in show business, believe me. They wouldn't let us into the clubs, but we could hear our song. We couldn't get into the club, but, yeah. <laughs> You guys are definitely yeah, uncool. That's good. Yeah. That, that little stock Aiken Waterman poison is... Yeah, that's there you go. That's yeah. right. We rang Mr Waterman and said, yes, <laughs> what, what beats per minute is the ideal dance tempo? And he wrote back and said, who are you? <laughs> <laughs> Kylie who? <laughs> Jason what? What experience inspired you initially to write about Aboriginal land rights? It was a request from an Aboriginal uh, tribe who'd been given back their land and their land included Ayers Rock, the big monolith in the centre of Australia, the most, our most, one of our most famous uh, tourist mm. exhibits. Uh, this was a tribal uh, group who um, were probably the most defiant fighters for their land, and they'd never given up the struggle for some hundred years, and eventually they got it back. So they decided to make a movie, uh, a 30 minute film about the handback. It was called Uluru, uh, and an Ungu story, because Uluru is the traditional name for Ezrock. They came to us and said, would you write us a song? And having knocked back Jovan and uh, Molson and <laughs> the equivalent in Australia, mm -hmm. we said, sure, but why don't you get an uh, Aboriginal band to do it? They said, no, uh, we'll get more people if you write it. So Beds Are Burning, an early version of Beds Are Burning, Dead Heart and another song were written. And we sent them off the rough tapes and they said that they loved Dead Heart. So we went into the studio and did that song, which was released as a single in Australia and had a degree of success. We had a couple of Aboriginal bands that had worked with us on the B-side. And we put the money from that into a royalty fund with the Department of Aboriginal Affairs to allow us and Warumpi Band to go into the desert to play. We'd received invitations from people because we'd spoken out about land rights and we'd just been building some bridges towards the Aboriginal community for years. But it was really the hand back of that big rock mm. that uh, was the starting point. Can you describe sort of your depth of feeling for just what the experience was like? No, I think it's very hard to describe it. <laughs> I really do. I think it's, it's very hard. Well, I mean, we're sitting, you know, behind a, ma a, a, mass, a massive edifice and uh, it's, it speaks to us about some things, but uh, its power derives from, from the amount of concrete that can be placed there. And we went to a place where the power derives from listening to the land and where a people had lived and had families and traded and developed their spiritual and their social lives over a period of time longer than any other existing civilization. I mean, that is, it's long-lasting, it's alive, it's oral, 
and it's deep. You know, it, it's very deep. Uh, if you look at somebody who's enormously successful in our terms, in our world, there's somebody who, for the most part, maybe has a bigger house than someone else. Or they can afford to spend more money on something, or they're flashier, or you see or hear about them in the newspapers more. Someone's success in Aboriginal culture is judged by completely different criteria. It's judged by how uh, honourable they are in their social obligations, how uh, spiritual they are in their, in their spiritual life, how uh, much they've given back to the land and to, and to their people. It's a, it's a different way around. One side is an exploitative, acquisitive side of things, and this is different. And uh, it's hard to speak about going into a living culture where they don't have things, where they don't own things, where they have a, a map in their own mind of the country and where they correspond to a part of the country or a physical feature, where their kin group corresponds with different other kin groups and there are sets of relationships that exist there, and where everybody knows what their place in things are. They were pleased to see us. They felt we were loud in some settlements. We went to different places. In the middle of Australia, in the desert areas, uh, the, the existence is much tougher and much harder. And those people are, have a much more intense uh, spiritual life. Ceremony is more important there. In the north, life is a little easier. They're dwelling on the coast, there's lots of fishing, there's uh, more, more food in abundance and so they're a much more social people and they just raged out to the oils like a, an audience in the cities would. Uh, so it was different in different places. In some places they had their land. Where Aboriginal people have their land, they have a basis for economic determination. They can make decisions for themselves, they have some dignity. So in those settlements, they were interesting settlements because they were taking control over their lives. In other places, they don't have their land. They're fringe dwellers, there's a lot of alcoholism, uh, a lot of disease, terrible third world conditions. It was like playing, it would be like playing in India, you know, who are you playing to us? What, what's it mean? It meant more when we'd actually finished playing and went and talked to people. It was really different in different places. We didn't know what to expect when we went and I think that was part of it, that the experiences were so markedly different in different places. This is a difficult thing, I think, for white boys that go into the bush and are given uh, a series of insights and get close to, to the culture that's still real. Their music is mainly sacred music, and that's why you don't hear much of it on the Alls record. We didn't feel that we could go and take it. And in fact, most you know, young Aboriginal bands don't play traditional music. It's chanting music. Uh, they use rhythm sticks and didgeridoo. Uh, the song cycles go for periods of two, three, four hours sometimes. A ceremonial life is very important in the bush and it, it takes a precedent over anything else. To give you an example, let's assume that uh, some Aboriginal people have got a job and they're working. Maybe they're building a, a bit of a road outside of the town. And let's assume that uh, in the coming week there's some ceremonies that they have to go and observe. Perhaps it's initiation ceremonies for the young men. Well then when the time comes from the ceremony they'll just go there and they'll be away for three or four days. And that takes a precedent over getting paid and over their job. And uh, those ceremonies will be very intense, almost um, uh, hypnotic series of, of uh, events that they partake in, and which obviously are quite profound for them. And we didn't see right into those uh, sacred ceremonies, but the music that we heard and, and the stuff that we were shown and that we were subject to, we realised that it had a sacred component, and so we felt it was better to leave well enough alone to take some of the atmosphere that we got to recognise that we're a rock band yeah. and uh, to, to, to play it as a rock band. Lately, and say in the last four years, a lot of uh, artists, there's been a sort of a greening of the artist consciousness. And, and that's greeted almost equally with enthusiasm and cynicism. Well, you can't do anything about cynicism. I mean, it's just an unfortunate disease that some people have and uh, they've got to cure themselves. Mm. Um, I think that you've got to take people on face value and artists stand up and say, I believe that we should do something for you know, the homeless people or for the trees or for whatever. You've got to say, great, yeah, we've got to do something about it. What are you mm -hmm. doing? And if they're doing something, it's fine. fine. Yeah. If they're just standing up to be part of the crowd mm -hmm. uh, and everything that the, else that they do is completely contradictory to that, then there's a reason for scratching your head. But I reckon we need as many people as we can get to yeah. be perfectly honest. Yeah, we reckon, we reckon that the 1990s have got to be the non-cynical decade because cynicism has got us to the point at the end of the 80s where 
you know, half the world can't breathe. We can't, we can't even swim here in Sydney. The oceans are polluted. Don't come to Sydney, folks, whatever they're telling you. Mm. Bondi Beach is polluted. There's no other word for it. You can't swim in it. You go in there and you'll get some sort of ear, nose and throat infection. And get what I've got. Which is what Pete's got. I mean, it, you know, let's throw cynicism aside and clean up this planet, for God's sake. You haven't aligned yourself with the big, the big benefits, the, you know, the amnesty tour or all, any of that stuff. Is, is that because you feel you can work better singularly than you could sort of in, in a mass campaign like that? Uh, not, not really, although partly that's right. They didn't ask us for some of them, <laughs> so you're not involved. Uh, with others, we felt that uh, the way in which they were done was compromising what they were on about. Mm. See, we've been, we, we were doing them long before they were the thing to do. They're just a part of the way that we work. They're not anything that we particularly think is special. We reckon that every uh, band should have it built into the way they work. That amount of commitment and uh, the ability to stand up and say, we think that young kids should have somewhere to live, so we're going to support a, a youth refuge program is something that people should do, or whatever it is. But uh, when we've done them, we found that uh, generally speaking, we like to see real impact, even if it's at a small level. We, we just don't think it's good enough to have propaganda, cliches, um, stars, and uh, a whole lot of people feeling good, and then uh, no follow-up, no context. So consequently, I, I think that we believe that the activities that were undertaken by Geldof and Everybody else that's got involved have been very worthwhile, and I think the Amnesty Tour, especially out of North America, was just mm. such a, an essential and such a good thing. But we're still faced with a problem here, and that is that people are coming to them and they're consuming them like they're consuming other rock things. And some people are going away with it. That's the principle that we all work on. Yet I think we've got to go further in the way we present things. I think we've really got to inform and educate and change people's minds. And we find that if something has got that component in it, then we'll, we'd love to get at it. But if it's simply something which is being done so that we all feel a little less guilty, then there's plenty of other people to feel less guilty than us. We realise the limitation of what we do in that we can talk about these things till we're blue in the face. It doesn't really make any difference if, A, people have got nowhere to go to, to, to uh, see out their desire and their wish and their concern. And also, if uh, many of them simply don't uh, let it go into their core, but just sort of, it's hip at the moment to, to be interested in amnesty. Mm. How many letters are people going to be writing in 15 years' time, you know? Are they going to be confronting their local member and, you know, they're, they're, are they going to be making their kids write letters? Are they going to be going down the street and are they going to be complaining when human rights are affected in their own country? Are they going to be going out to march? Are they going to be prepared to go to jail, which is what amnesty people is all about? They're people who are prepared to go to jail because they believe in something. Mm. So, you know, Am I going to be prepared to go to jail? You know, I mean, th these are serious questions. Not the right place, not on a rock show. This is the wrong place for them all together. <laughs> Don't turn off. Something light and frothy and irrelevant will arrive in a minute. Has reading in general the idea of, of literature had a big musical influence on the band? You mentioned Henry Lawson in this record. I think the answer to that from everybody is going to be yes, isn't it? You're all big readers? Of, yeah. di of very different things, I'd like say. Yeah. Okay, well, I don't you mind. Read. Yeah, uh, uh, for me... I can tell you what you read. Yeah. In Australia, I don't know if it still happens in North America, but they lob this huge newspaper which comes tumbling in and destroys your azaleas every morning. Mm -hmm. Pete's always read the paper and spreads it out and he's got his table on the bus and it sort of spreads over and everyone else sort of has to get around him while he's figuring out world events of great importance. I am a media and junkie. Like that. Yeah. Yeah. I read the newspapers and I, I, I would read uh, environmental literature and sort of reports and that sort of stuff because I need to now. Cause Comics? Because of my other job. Not often. <laughs> we produce an oil rag, you know, for people to, to, to read. Uh -huh. <coughs> uh, so we hope that people are going to read. <coughs> which is like a word accompaniment to, Basil, to, to the you music. Got that? Can you see it, Basil? With axes in its eyes. Now that's a reference to a political leader here, right? Um, oh, there's a, there's corporation, a there. corporate, New South Wales Inc. Yes, yeah. indeed. Free market, we have, um, regulated. We have guns. a lot of uh, wonderful bushland in Australia, which um, is about to uh, go under the, the loggers and the bulldozers if we don't fight hard. I mean, I know it's a situation that you have in Canada, and 
I must tell you that we were in Toronto in fall, or what we call autumn, and it was absolutely the most beautiful place. No, See, we don't have deciduous trees like that. We, we have the Australian bush uh, with kangaroos and kookaburras. And it's, I mean, we think that's heaven and a lot of it's disappeared and axes in its eyes is just a way of saying there's still a lot of corporations out there that like to make money out of wood pulp, which they sell to places like Japan, which comes back in highly expensive newsprint. I mean, when we could do it all ourselves and recycle it. Oh, I believe that our world can be the way that we want it to. I've always believed that. And in our little part of the world, we've had some wins and we've also had some losses, but we've had some wins. So I figure if we in our little world can have some wins, just think how many wins we could have with lots of people. Well, that frightens the people that don't want us to have the wins. It's no different to the story as it was uh, 200 years ago, 500 years ago. The majority of wealth is uh, owned by a minority of people. The majority of decisions are made by a handful of people. Uh, there is no morality in business. You know, you put an environment minister in in America who doesn't believe in the environment, and you've got acid rain in America. Uh, and you've got acid rain in Canada as well. And eventually we're going to have acid rain in Tasmania, you know, in the Southern Hemisphere. Now, you know, you stop finding business for putting junk in uh, this lake here, and then they'll start finding, they'll put junk in the lake again. You know, they don't care. Uh, like it's a profit sheet at the end of the day, and that's all there is to it. Now, we've got to take a longer view than that. And I think that if you take a longer view, you can see that there are big issues, but you can also see that you can do something about it. We've never really worried too much about, you know, whether it's going to be a big record in the world or whether people uh, are going to see a song as a single or anything of that sort. You know, it's just these, this was the music of, of this particular time when these people were, were, were living together. Specifically, it's about a place called Wittenoom in Western Australia, which is an as asbestos mine that they had between the 1940s and the 1960s and operated by one of the Australian companies who knew about the dangers of asbestos dust, as everyone does now, but nevertheless, 7,000 young men went in and at least 2,000 aren't gonna walk out again, you know, and it hasn't become really well known because um, the company keeps on settling with the litigants with secrecy clauses, so the people like yourself never get to hear it. Although there have been some very good documentaries in Australia about it, um, the rest of the world certainly wouldn't be aware of it in the same breath as a Bhopal or a Chernobyl or something like that, but the, but the damage it's done to the people that work there is equal. Yeah. It was quite a typical attitude too of, of companies here to get the labour from overseas, whether they came from Europe or Yugoslavia or Greece or from England and get people in who didn't really have much of a, a social structure to relate to, who maybe didn't have that many resources, use them up as mine fodder, you know, they were making good money at the time and then sort of throw them on the scrap heap and so in a sense the song is specifically about that but it's also you know, like a metaphor mm. for that sort of stuff that's happening everywhere in the world. It's got a more right? international context as well, you know, mm. because here, almost every city in the United States and Canada would have its legacy of industrial catastrophe. Mm. With the whole of the Blue Sky album, you know, we wanted to do stuff which was direct and, you know, spoke about what was going on and what people felt, but at the same time ended up with a bit of spirit of hope, because we've still got some hope. And what Rob was saying, you know, about the fact that uh, some of these people eventually got their case to court. Some of them will get some justice. Justice was there at the end. The rain coming down, a metaphor for the fact that, you know, if you struggle long enough, then you'll get some justice. Tell me about the song of Forgotten Years. <clears throat> the first time I thought, I thought that was a single, actually, and the first time I heard it. It's... And then you read the lyrics. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, see, this is, this is endemic to Oil's music for me and lyrics, is that that you can be more specific if you care to look into it. On the other side, the songs exist in a very general sort sure. of earth. You know. yeah. um, every man, way. But the Forgotten Years has some specific references in as well. Yeah, you should, you should well, it's about Anzacs. Years. I mean, Canadians know about Anzacs, don't they? Australian, New Zealand, Army Corps? Hmm. No, and, they don't. And Canadians? Mm -mm. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was the Army Corps, you know, Australians and New Zealands going off to fight in Colonial wars. In the Sudan or in uh, South Africa or they, they fought in First World War alongside the French or Second World War in Germany or in the Middle East. You know, they were the Anzacs. They were the diggers with the medals and they march on April the 25th mm. every year. And I guess what we were saying in forgotten years was that um, we have a generation now, you know, the, the lucky generation that is neither conscripted or getting bullied off by some well-meaning or otherwise government to fight someone else's war and that's a quite a unique situation in historical terms yeah mm. and it's something that promotes our easygoing lifestyle and what it is to be australian you know the beaches you know the, everything's fine you know we don't worry about too much around here you know it's 
on the other end of the world, we're out of the major battlefields of past, and, you know, but we're not actually because we've always been dragged into that and although we've never had a major war in our soil, we've, we've gone and fought them for other people and for ourselves. And, mm. And Forgotten Years is about some of those people that went and fought for us to give us the peace that we enjoy today, I suppose. America has been, in, in terms of, of the symbols, rather black and white. I mean, they've always, for, for you guys, you, your music lyrically has been littered with American references. And this time again, Elvis. Elvis is in here. What does he symbolize? Oh, oh well, I, I, can I quickly tell the Elvis story? I mean, Please. it's, it's yeah. just that... When we were touring in 88... No, we the... didn't go to Graceland. No, no, no. <laughs> we were the only band not to go to Graceland. <laughs> we were determined not to go to Graceland. I mean, we didn't give a about Graceland. We struck <laughs> Memphis off the touring island. <laughs> Excuse me. But uh, every time we booked into, a, into a, one of these hotels, we'd be sort of signing at the desk and there'd be an Elvis impersonator. <laughs> and I read this thing in the paper and it said that, you know, the rate of... A number of increase in the number of Elvis impersonators by the year 2010. Every second adult in the United States is going to be an Elvis impersonator. <laughs> it was like wherever you look, there was an Elvis impersonator. Yeah. And it was just this whole idea that heartbreak you know, hotel, indeed. Yeah, <laughs> that they that they've got this icon, and not only you know did they sort of did they be, did they praise him up, you know, allow him to stuff himself full of bad food and drugs and destroy himself and the, the whole tragic story of Elvis. But now there's a whole million tragic little Elvises going around repeating the whole exercise. And everybody's getting off on the fact that he's been recited. And I mean, it was just the bizarrest, weird... I mean, a society which had completely lost touch with reality mm. is a society of that kind. And I mean, we've got some aspects in our own society which aren't all that real either, but it just struck... Well, we think it's funny in North America the way they elevate pop stars and people to these incredible, you know, dimensions, these larger-than-life figures, because it's quite the opposite on Australia. You know, you can walk down to the local shop and buy a pint of milk and someone might say, G'day, Rob. But that's as far as it'll go, you know. Yeah, but there was, there was Elvis, sort of, you know, with his million bodyguards and servants and a big wall and vicious dogs, you know, hiding behind this wall going mad. You know, it doesn't happen here. You still don't have a star culture here, particularly, or, yeah. or a superstar culture. And uh, if you even get pushed into that position from overseas, everybody's got a habit of bringing you back to Earth here, which is extremely necessary, healthy and very refreshing. Mm. But it's going to happen out there. I'm yes, not... but we just get in the bus, you see, and we close the door and we have our little cocoon which travels <laughs> around the world and we make our tea and we, and we see holiday inns modest. and that's it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now we're talking reality. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Forget the glamour, folks. It's not glamorous. <laughs> Anyone ever told you it's glamorous, it ain't. As you get more and more of a platform to say what you mean, not necessarily your effect doesn't increase the same way. So there must be something, you know, no matter how big a voice I have, is it still actually doing anything? I think that uh, we've probably got more power, in inverted commas, I've got to stress it's in inverted commas, we've mm -hmm. probably got more power because of the way that we do it, uh, as much as what it is that we're saying. And I think that uh, if you're doing it well, then maybe you're going to touch some people, and if you're touching some people, then you're succeeding. But I think that it's really quite easy to imagine that there's an enormous amount of influence and reach that people have at this level. And I think they've got kind of a quasi influence in terms of being uh, icons or role models, but I don't think it goes much past that. I mean, I don't think that seven rock bands with top ten records can sort of alter the course of history. You know, it'd be nice, well, it would depend who they were, but <laughs> maybe it wouldn't be nice. It's a, very, it's a very intangible and incremental thing. I mean, we, Hard to measure. We're, we're involved very much, as you know, in the anti-nuclear cause in the early 80s, and by the end of the 80s you find that the superpowers are starting to unlock horns, you know, so we didn't expect things, you know, six months, 12 months down the track to change, but you find that gradually down the track with the peace marches and people out in the streets and writing letters and talking to your friends and doing interviews like this, you know, it's an incremental thing and it's not something you can expect to happen like that, but you've got to have patience, haven't you, for all good things. There you go, there you go. Ooh. Peter Garrett, Midnight Oil, and our Midnight Oil special for you for your listening and dancing pleasure. And uh, as